Let's rise up for prayer. Our loving Father, we bless your dear name. We glorify you because we can call you Father. We're your very own children. Jesus is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit has been promised to us as a comforter. We thank you because of the promises you have given to us. And with great expectation we are gathered before you. And we know that if we keep our appointment with you, fulfill the conditions you have given us, the heavens will be opened. The windows of heaven will open. And your mighty power will be upon us as individuals and as a church in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Father, we're looking up to you. And we're believing that in your power, in your might, you will magnify and glorify yourself in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting this uh, study of Acts of the Apostles with great expectation. Knowing what you have said, knowing the promise you have given to us, and we know that that promise will be fulfilled in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Open our understanding. Amen. Open the scriptures to us and fill us to overflowing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you have known us, you are told on Thursday as well as on Sunday, that with great expectation and anticipation, we're starting the study of the book of Acts. We're excited for many reasons. That is, we're so happy that the days have come that we as the body of Christ in this place, we're getting into the deep study of the book of Acts and we're happy and excited for many reasons. Number one, we've been told that when the Spirit comes upon the believer as an individual, great power is manifested supernatural boldness is manifested faith becomes dynamic and active wisdom comes into the believer in an unpredictable unprecedented measure and then the glory of god and great insight into the scriptures and revelation comes to the believer and when the husband and the wife are both spirit filled Spirit indwelled, spirit empowered, spirit closed, and spirit anointed. There is wonderful boldness and combination of faith and wisdom and majesty and glory and revelation in that home. And if the body of Christ, that means the local church with all its members, the brothers and the sisters, yield to the overflowing and doing power of the Holy Ghost, there is no predicting, there is no telling the great power, majesty, glory that will be manifested by such a local body of believers. And so that is why we are so excited and so happy that we are getting into the study of the Acts of the Apostles. And so you have seen one reason we are studying the book of the Apostles. We are studying because we know that God remains the same, he has not changed. Jesus Christ remains the same, he has not changed. And the Holy Ghost is the same, he has not changed. And what the Lord and God and the Holy Ghost did in the early church, full of the Holy Ghost, is able to do and willing to do and ready to do in this church today, as we too, as we are close and endued and empowered by that same Holy Ghost. But then we also realize that as we look at the apostles and the disciples, now if you notice me very carefully, I'm joining the disciples and apostles together. Because when the Holy Ghost came in the Acts of the Apostles, it came on the young and the old, the men and the women, came on the apostles and the disciples. There was no division, there was no hierarchy, and there was no favoritism. It came upon all people that fulfilled the condition. And so the apostles and the disciples received the Holy Ghost. And I said, if you look at those apostles and disciples, before they received the Holy Ghost, they were weak. After the Holy Ghost came, they were strong. 
before they received the Holy Ghost, there was failure sometimes when they prayed. After they received the Holy Ghost, every prayer they prayed received an answer. Before they received the Holy Ghost, they were powerless and faceless and, and fearful. But after the Holy Ghost came, power came, boldness came, faith came in a dynamic way. Before they received the Holy Ghost, they were foolish. They trembled before the enemy. But after the Holy Ghost came, there was fear no more. There was doubt no more. But on the other hand, wisdom came upon them and they became bold as bold as a lion. And they went forth in the power of the Holy Ghost and they did mighty things in the name of the Lord. Before the Holy Ghost came, they were hiding in their rooms behind closed doors. After the Holy Ghost came, they came out of that room. And they went out in great power and boldness and they gave testimony and witness to the resurrected and risen Lord Jesus Christ. And multitudes believed. I told you yesterday that before the Holy Ghost came, they received the promise, but the promise was only in their heart. It was not fulfilled yet. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. When did they become fishers of men? The day of Pentecost came, the Holy Ghost came, and that promise was fulfilled. They actually saw it. They became fishers of men. Multitudes were turned to the Lord. I told you before they received the Holy Ghost, the promise was given to them, I'll make, you I'll make you the lights of the world. Ye are the lights of the world, but they enlightened nobody. They themselves were still ignorant. But Jesus was telling them, what I tell you in secret, you rise up on the housetop and you declare it upon the housetop. They never got on the roof of any house. They never got on the housetop anywhere before the Holy Ghost came. But the Holy Ghost came. They got on the housetop. In fact, it came upon them in the upper room in a housetop and it started declaring and magnifying the name of the Lord, declaring the wonderful works of the Lord. And it started proclaiming and declaring the word of God from housetop when the Holy Ghost came. They were just a kind of wheat before the Holy Ghost came. After the Holy Ghost came, they turned into a multitude. They bore fruit and much fruit. It was a mustard seed they were before the Holy Ghost came. But the Holy Ghost came upon them. They became a mighty tree. And they became taller than any tree on the face of the earth. And from every direction in the world, they saw them because they were energized and empowered by the Holy Ghost. What are we saying? We are saying, when the Holy Ghost came, the church changed. We are saying, when the Holy Ghost comes today, this church will change. A change will come, a transformation will come on the brothers and the sisters. A transformation will come upon everybody in the church when the Holy Ghost comes upon the church. The weak will become strong, the fearful will become fearless, and those who are weak will become bold and powerful in the Lord, and those who are foolish will become wise, and then will become fishers of men in truth, will become the lights of the world in reality. The corn of which will bring forth much fruit and many more grains will come up when the Holy Ghost comes. And then will not remain the little Mossad seed will become a mighty tree, taller than every tree around. And there will be attention that will be drawn to Christ and to the church of the Christ. And many will come to the church. When the Holy Ghost came in the Acts of the Apostles, then... Christ's purpose was fulfilled, was fulfilled for the church, and that purpose is in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power. The Greek, work is, the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite or dynamo or dynamic. Which means many things happen to you when the Holy Ghost comes. You receive the dunamis in the Greek, you, remiss, you receive the dynamo, the dynamite will become dynamic in English, and then... That the whole, after the Holy Ghost says, come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. The Greek is maturus, and that means you become a martyr for the Lord. Well, the martyr doesn't, meet a, doesn't just mean a person that is, you know, dying for Christ. It means a person living for Christ. Every minute, every moment of the day, you become a witness. And you are living for Christ and dying for Christ. You are down for Christ and up for Christ, on the mountain for Christ and the valley for Christ. I mean, everywhere you are, you are just a witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. The Holy Ghost came upon the church in the upper room, they were a witness. In the prison, they were a witness. On the seashore, they were a witness. In the boat, they were a witness. On the stormy sea, they were a witness. Before the persecutors, they were a witness. What I mean is every time, everywhere, any moment, anywhere, you become a witness for the Lord when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. 
and your life will no more be divided into various sections. You know, there are some people who are different in their place of work, different in the church, different in the home, different on the street, but when the Holy Ghost comes upon you in the house, on the street, in the bus, in the office, in the church, you are a witness everywhere and anywhere, in the town and in the village. Anywhere you go, you become a witness. It says, ye shall receive power. You'll become a dynamite. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, unto Christ. Unto Christ. Now, do you realize the weak cannot bear testimony for the strong? The foolish cannot bear testimony for the wise? The indolent cannot bear testimony for the industrious? But Jesus Christ is powerful, Jesus is authoritative, Jesus Christ is wise, Jesus Christ is exalted, Jesus Christ is glorified, Jesus Christ is supernatural. And then if you are going to be a testimony, you are going to be a witness to a supernatural, wise, powerful, authoritative person. What do you have to be? Well, just the same way. You want to be a testimony to somebody that is wise? You must be wise. You want to be a testimony to somebody that is great and mighty. You yourself must have the great power of God. And until then, you cannot be an effective witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It's glorified, it's risen, it's resurrected, it's exalted, it's supernatural. And therefore, you must receive that power before you will become a witness unto him. In Jerusalem, where he was crucified. In Jerusalem, where they, where they just denied him, blasted him, whipped him, and beat him and broke him down and just crucified him slain, slew him and he died in that same place where they rejected him in that same place where they buried him in that same place where they rejected him you'll be a witness you remember the disciples and the apostles they were scattered when Jesus was taken they became afraid, they started trembling they hid behind closed doors the power had not come the Holy Ghost had not come. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He showed himself to them. And he began to tell them, You are going to be my witnesses, but not now. You are going to be my witnesses, but something must happen to you to change you, to transform you before you'll be my witnesses. Otherwise, you'll still be hiding. Otherwise, you'll still be fearful. Otherwise, you'll still be powerless. Otherwise, you'll still be weak in your knees and in your heart. There will be no courage in you. But you'll receive power. The dunamis of God will come upon you. The dynamo of God will come upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then in Judea. That's the province of the region all around Jerusalem. And then in Samaria, I told you, that's a mixed race. They were Jews before, but you know, the northern kingdom fell away, fell apart. And they went into idolatry until the Jews rejected them. They were fake, false, counterfeit Jews. Id idolatrous, they were at this time. And Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. Follow me. You see, before they received the Holy Ghost, Jesus told them, you go and preach, but only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You must not go into the cities of Samaria because, you see, your ministry is limited before the Holy Ghost comes. But after the Holy Ghost has come, you'll be my witnesses in Samaria. And then he says, unto the uttermost part of the earth. I'm asking you a question. What can you do, for example, without the Holy Ghost, if you go to a city, a country, a village, where you don't know their language? Nothing. I'm asking you, what can you do without the Holy Ghost, without the power of the Holy Ghost, if you go to a place where you don't understand their language, where they have never read the Bible, where they have never seen Jesus Christ, where they have never heard of the name Jesus Christ that died and rose from the dead. What can you do when the people are totally ignorant, they are living in the uttermost part of the earth? What can you do without the Holy Ghost? Nothing. But you see, Jesus said, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. Power will come upon you. You'll become my witnesses, powerful witnesses, faithful witnesses, bold witnesses. And witnesses that are glorious and glorified in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And they did it. That was the will of God. Let me tell you something. 
Before you receive the Holy Ghost, you'll know the will of God in many areas of your life. But there's a particular area of your life which is reaching out in the mission field. You know, your office is a mission field. The street is a mission field. The community is a mission field. Nigeria is a mission field. Ghana is a mission field. Africa is a mission field. And beyond Africa is a mission field. You will know the will of God about your mission field before the Holy Ghost comes. And you try to reach out in the mission field before the Holy Ghost comes, you'll be able to do nothing. But when the Holy Ghost comes, and you see the will of God on reaching out on your mission field, You'll be able to do exploit before, because you know the triune God. You know God the Father, you know Jesus Christ, and you know the Holy Ghost. And then you'll be able to carry out the mission of God for your life. And uh, this is the reason we're studying Acts of the Apostles. The major purpose of the book of Acts of the Apostles is to give us a story of the spread of Christianity, empowered and energized by the Holy Spirit throughout the world. And it, it started. Now, understand something. When it's the Holy Ghost working, you start in Jerusalem. Do you know that with the power of the Holy Ghost, they started in Jerusalem, then they went to Judea. You know, without the Holy Ghost, you start the work in Jerusalem. By the time you go to Judea, the work in Jerusalem will die out, fade out. But you know, the power of the Holy Ghost was upon them. They walked in Jerusalem. By the time they went to Judea, the fire in Jerusalem was still burning. It's a type of a spiral activity. Then they went from Judea, they went to Samaria. By the time they were dynamically publicizing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel in Samaria, the fire was burning in Jerusalem and Judea. It never died out. Listen to me. The work of a man that is full of the Holy Ghost will continue for a long time. It never dies out. It goes on and on and on. And that's why I'm telling you that at this period when we're getting to the book of Acts, deep into the Acts of the Apostles, you will surrender yourself and submit yourself. And then make yourself available to the study of this book. There is a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing you have benefit and profit in the study of this book. The Holy Ghost will come upon the person that is studying studying with the right mind, with the whole mind, with the right attention, the whole attention. And then you walk in Jerusalem, you go to Judea, the walk in Jerusalem is still staying. You go to Samaria, the walk in Judea is still staying. And then from Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth, and you'll find out while you're in the uttermost part of the earth, the walk in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria will still be going on the fire, will still be burning. And that is what happened to them. And uh, in fact, the whole book of Acts is divided into these various sections. If you follow the book of Acts very well, you can outline the book of Acts into just Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Chapters 1 to 7 talk about the beginning and the growth of the work in Jerusalem. From chapters 1 to 7. And um, from chapters 8 and 9, you have the scattering of the church all through Judea and Samaria. Just following the line, following the steps, following the blueprint and the pattern and the wheel that Jesus had given unto them. Before the Holy Ghost comes, you'll be here today and there tomorrow, wondering whether you're in the will of God or not. When the Holy Ghost comes, if you are really following that Holy Spirit, he'll be leading you and guiding you, and you will just be in the center of the will of God every time. When he wants you to be in Jerusalem, you'll be in Jerusalem. I mean, when you are really full and overflowing of the Spirit of God. When he wants you to be in Judea, you'll be in Judea. When he wants you to be in Samaria, you'll be in Samaria. When he wants you in the uttermost part of the earth, you'll be right there at the right time, at the right moment, when the Holy Ghost has come. And you see chapters 9 to 12 talk about the explosion of the church into Antioch. That's already moving into the uttermost part of the earth. And from chapters 12 to 16, you have the spread of the church in Asia Minor and Galatia. In chapters 16 to 19, you have the ex extension of the church in Ephesus and Corinth. And you, you have 19 to 28, you have the arrival of the church at the capital of the world empire in Rome. Because at this time, Rome was, you know, the capital of the Roman Empire. And I told you before when we were studying Daniel that there had been major world empires before, uh, since the world began. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Middle Persia, and Greece, and then you have Rome. And here we are told 
that eventually the church and Christianity and the faith and the gospel arrived in Rome, they had done exactly what the Lord had said. Let me show you. At the time of um, the Jerusalem, the work in Jerusalem, I told you that's from chapters 1 to 7, the work in Jerusalem. Look at what he said in chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. The word of the Lord, the number of the disciples multiplied, multiplied, multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. The Holy Ghost had come, and therefore they preached only one message, thousands are converted. They say anything is backed up by the power of God. In the second section, which is the scattering of the church in Judea and, and Samaria, uh, look at uh, chapter, nine, chapter 9, Acts 9, verse 31. Then are the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Again, the words were multiplied, were multiplied, were multiplied. Before you have the Holy Ghost, sometimes... Uh, you throw a dry, a, 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 an empty bucket into a dry well, and it's just bang, 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 no result. Nothing comes out. But you know, the Holy Ghost comes, and you're you are pulling that water out of the well of salvation. Out of your belly is coming out rivers of living water, and everywhere that living water goes is making people to come alive. Sinners are getting saved. The sick are getting healed. And the word of God is multiplying. The number of disciples are getting multiplied everywhere you go because the Holy Ghost has come. That's why we're concentrating on the Acts of the Apostles. So that the believers will stop throwing the empty bucket into the dry well, just banging things without any result, without drawing any water out. But the Holy Ghost will come upon you and then the rivers of waters will be coming out according to that promise. Out of your bellies, out of your heart will come out rivers of living water. And everywhere it touches, you know the people will just come alive. And um, in the explosion of the church to Antioch, let's see in um, Acts chapter 12, verse 24. But the word of God grew, the word again multiplied multiplied the Holy Ghost had come and in Jerusalem multiplication of membership in the church in Judea and Samaria multiplication of membership in the church and then going on to Antioch again it is multiplication in the church because the Holy Ghost has come and it makes all the difference then the spread of the church into Asia Minor and Galatia and in Acts chapter 16 verse 5 Acts chapter 16 verse 5 and so were the churches established, established, established in the faith and increased in number daily. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. You see, the Spirit is mentioned in, in the Acts of the Apostles about 60 times and the Holy Spirit in particular is mentioned about 40 times. Everything in Acts of the Apostles revolves, surrounds the Holy Ghost. The people were full of the Holy Ghost and due to the Holy Ghost and part by the Holy Ghost, closed with the Holy Ghost, surrounded and enveloped by the Holy Ghost. And everywhere they went, the power of the Holy Ghost was working in a dynamic way. And today when you study the acts of the apostles of the right mind, the right motive, the right attitude, the right expectation, the right faith, and the proper condition, when you study with the right attitude, the Holy Ghost will come upon you as well and change you and transform you. And everywhere you go, there will be the multiplication of the church. The gospel will be preached in power. The sick will be healed and people will be delivered as well. And in the next section, which is the extension of the church in Ephesus and Corinth, in chapter 19, verse 20, the account tell, tells us, Acts chapter 19, verse 20, it says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Well, the devil was there, but the devil did not prevail. There were demon-possessed people, they didn't prevail. There were enemies, they did not prevail. There were opposers and persecutors against the church, they did not prevail. That promise was fulfilled. Oh, wonderful God. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. But you know, before the Holy Ghost came, the disciples were, they, they were, they were fearing and hiding. Fear prevailed on them. Discouragement prevailed on them. The devil prevailed on them. Simon, Simon, Satan has wanted to sift you like wheat, 
but Satan sifted him like wheat. The devil prevailed on him, but the Holy Ghost came. The Holy Ghost came. The Holy Ghost came, and the devil no more could prevail. Fear no more could prevail. Enemies no more could prevail. But now the church and the word of God was prevailing. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That's the result, that's the benefit, and that's the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, coming upon the church. And that's what we're looking for. That in the rank and file of believers in this church, as we get into the study of the Acts of the Apostles, no more will Satan prevail. No more will, see, will evil spirits prevail. No more will people with paths of darkness prevail. But everywhere we go, as individuals, as brothers and sisters, the word of God, the power of God, the spirit of God, the church of God will prevail in Jesus' name. Amen. The days are coming and the days are starting right now. That the Holy Ghost will come upon his church in a mighty way. And the word and the church will prevail everywhere that we go. And in the very last chapter, chapter 28, as the church went in the as with the representative paul the apostle and he went into rome you remember that long journey in acts chapter 27 as he got into the ship and you know that was where a boy testimony in the ship when 276 souls were there with him he said i believe god it shall be as he told me the angel of the lord appeared to me and told me he has given me the souls that are with me in the ship and he became the master the lord the commander in that ship because he was a man full of the holy ghost they were taking him to Rome to imprison him. But on, he, on his way to Rome, the power of God was still mightily working. And here is the record we're told in verses 30 and 31. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, with all boldness, with all wisdom, with all faith, with all majesty and glory, with all insight and revelation of the gospel truth, no man forbidding him. I told you, when the Holy Ghost has come, preaching will be easy. Before the Holy Ghost comes, you'll be finding verses in the Bible you'll talk about. Before the Holy Ghost comes, there'll be worry and dread in your heart when you are to preach. Before the Holy Ghost comes, there'll be fear in your heart as to what will I tell the people. Before the Holy Ghost comes, you'll be wondering what will be the result of the preaching. After the Holy Ghost has come, there is freedom in preaching because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty to preach, liberty to pray, liberty to deliver, liberty to heal the sick, liberty to walk in the will of God, in the dynamic power of God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and there is boldness. And he was preaching the word of the kingdom of God and teaching those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, with all confidence, with all faith, with all power, with all authority. No man, no man forbidding him. You cannot forbid a man full of the Holy Ghost. You cannot hinder a man, put a man in bondage who is full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will take the bondage up, break all the, all the fetters and, and totally destroy all the things that used to bind him. In fact, look at it. Whether he was in the prison or on the seashore or on the street or in the village or in the city, anywhere he went or in the boat or on his way to Rome, he was always preaching the gospel. No man can forbid a man that is full of the Holy Ghost. And so we see that there's a great purpose a wonderful purpose for our study in the Acts of the Apostles. Now let's go back to chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. And you should by this time have decided why you are studying this book. Because you see, if you approach the word of God, the Acts of the Apostles in the right motive, the right attitude, and you will receive what you are designing from the book of Acts of the Apostles. I'll remind you, you are studying this book because... You have realized, my brother, my sister, before now you have been weak, fearful, doubtful, worrying, anxious. Before this time you have been trembling. Before this time your prayer has not been able to reach heaven the way you want it to reach heaven. Before this time you have realized areas of weakness in your life. And you are studying this book, Acts of the Apostles, because you are looking for the time when the Holy Ghost will come and boldness will come, power will come, wisdom will come, faith will come, revelation will come, glory will come. That's why you are studying the book. You are studying this book because you realize there was a time you were hiding behind closed doors. 
You feared persecutors. You feared, you feared enemies of the gospel. You have come to study Acts of the Apostles because you want the Holy Ghost to descend so much upon you, you will fear no fool. Not even the devil will be able to turn you around. You are studying this book because you see that you have been cold. But you know that when you get into the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost gets into you, fire will come upon you because they will baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire. You have realized that you are cold and you want to be hot on fire for Christ. That's why you are studying these Acts of the Apostles. You are studying this because you see that you do not know how to spread the gospel, how to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost part of the earth. You do not know how to make use of your opportunity as a preacher in your mission field, in your village, in your town, in your office, at the center here, anywhere you go. You have seen that when you stand up to preach, your word is powerless. Your word is not anointed. You have come to study Acts of the Apostles because you know that when you study, your preaching will change, your prayer will change, the manifestation of God's authority in you will change. That's why you have come to study the book. Then you'll become a preacher, an evangelist, a proclaimer of the gospel, a missionary. That may be a missionary here, you've gone into the mission field without the power of God, without the great motivating factor, because you see, the Holy Ghost is the one that equips us for missionary work. And you see that you failed the first time you went out. And you're approaching the Acts of the Apostles because you realize, studying this book, you'll see the pattern of church planting. You'll see the mode of world evangelization. You'll see how to go into the missionary field and do the work in a proper way. And everywhere you go, you'll bear fruit and your fruit will abide and remain. That's why you have come to study this book. And as we launch into the book, uh, today I'm studying only verses 1 to 11. And in verses 1 to 11, I show you six things. The message, the manifestation, the might, the mystery, the mission, and the motive. There is a pertinent message that the Lord wants you to hear. The Lord wants you to know. Now, listen to me, my brother, my sister. I've been in various circles where we talk about the Holy Ghost. And uh, I've been invited to various places where they, they were discussing on the Holy Ghost. Many years ago, they invited me to Eloni and they invited uh, students from Igbaja Seminary to come and listen to me talk on, the, on holiness and the Holy Ghost. And these were theological students. And these were people who did not believe that there should be any Holy Ghost after you are saved. And they asked many questions on the Holy Ghost. They asked many questions on getting holy and getting sanctified and having the Holy Ghost upon your life. And when they pass out of seminary at Igbaja, that they will be able to reach out and then reach out with the gospel and uh, in a dynamic way and get so saved. I've been invited to the UMC at Ilani where, you know, people were studying Greek and studying a number of things. And there were some of the Greek lecturers there. And they, they gathered together. They wanted me to talk about this uh, thing called sanctification and the Holy Ghost. And these were people that, you know, uh, they do not, they are not Pentecostal. They don't uh, stand the same way we Pentecostals stand. And they wanted to see whether there was a way they could defeat the message of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I've been invited to places where people were not even born again, not born again at all, and they wanted me to talk on the Holy Ghost. I've been invited to places where they were ultra and hyper Pentecostal, where they just wanted to receive the Holy Ghost without even getting saved and getting sanctified. What I'm telling you is that I've been invited to various places to talk on the Holy Ghost. And I discover that many people have wrong ideas, wrong motives, and wrong conception about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. You know, some people have the idea that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you'll just be speaking in tongues every moment of the day. You, you, you want to talk to your friend, you speak in tongues. You want to eat and you're praying on your food, you speak in tongues. You want to pray, you know, the evening prayer before going to bed, you speak in tongues. Every time you just speak in tongues and speak in tongues and speak in tongues. Is it like that? Well, you'll discover as we study Acts of the Apostles. I've discovered that there are people who say they have the Holy Ghost and they speak in tongues, and yet all these things that came upon the believers in the Acts of the Apostles, when they receive the Holy Ghost, it's, they are not on them. Boldness is not there, but they speak in tongues. Power is not there. Authority is not there. Revelation is not there. Wisdom is not there. Faith is not there. Glory is not there. And yet they, they tell us and they testify that they have got the Holy Ghost coming on them. My brother, my sister, I don't want you to receive a limited experience. When the Holy Ghost comes, it comes with the whole parcel. 
They're speaking in tongues, the power, the authority, the energy of the spirit, the wisdom, the boldness of faith, the insight into the scripture, the revelation, the glory, everything in the same package. And it comes as a comforter. And so when the Holy Ghost comes, it's not just a limited ministry of just praying in tongues. It's much, much more, much, much more than speaking in tongues. And I've gone to places where they, they thought, well, we, we're going for a meeting and they're going to talk on the Holy Ghost. And, you know, everybody will just start speaking in tongues immediately. But no, my brother, it wasn't so with the early apostles. Because Jesus Christ came to them and he told them, you must wage. Couldn't he do it? After all, John had said, I, I'm baptizing you with water, but there comes one after me whose shoes I'm not able to bear. When he comes, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He tells us that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. In Mark chapter 1, verse 8, he tells us again, I baptize with water, but one is coming greater than myself. Who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire? Then he tells us in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, I am baptizing you with water, but one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He tells us in John chapter 1, verse 33 downwards, he says, I just come baptizing with water but the one that sent me baptizing he told me that upon whom I see the spirit descending and abiding he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire and yet when Jesus came after his resurrection he didn't immediately baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire he told them wait in Jerusalem why were they to wait I'll tell you you see before you meet the Holy Ghost you must meet Jesus Christ first before the Holy Ghost will come upon you, in the endowment of power, will close you, will envelope you, will surround you, will come within you, will overflow from you. Before that time, you must meet the Lord Jesus Christ. There is peace and purity before power comes. And I find people that don't have the peace of God, don't have the purity of Christ, and then they're looking for power. No, not like that. The power will come, but you know, you count one before you count two. You count two before you count three. Peace first, purity next, power next, salvation first, sanctification next, spirit baptism next. And so the pertinent message first, and after that a personal manifestation of the, res of the risen resurrected Christ, and after that the promised might, then the prophetic mystery, then the purposeful mission, and then the proper motive. And here we start from Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. The former treaties as have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now somebody is writing to somebody. There are two people here. One is writing, the other is receiving the letter. There are two people here. One is uh, putting the treaties down, and uh, the other one is receiving the treaties that is written and sent. The one that is receiving it is Theophilus. I suppose you know enough Greek now to know that there are some Greek words we use for love. You have agape, you have phileo. And phileo, phileo means, uh, you know, to, to be friendly and to love. And uh, theo means uh, God. And so when you join those two, uh, those two words together, theo and phileo, which means theophilos, you have a lover of God, a friend of God, a beloved of God. So that's the meaning of that name, theophilos, beloved of God, friend of God, a God lover. And this Theophilus had come into the gospel. He had received the gospel. He had been born again. He was a child of God. But there was somebody who knew about it, who wanted to do the proper follow-up by writing to him and telling him more about Jesus, more about what Jesus began to do and what he taught, more about the miracles and the messages of Jesus, more about the wonders and the words of Jesus Christ. And he said, well, Theophilus, let me write everything to you. And he wrote the first one called the former treatise. Have I made, O oh, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, the miracle and the message? Who is this Theophilus? This Theophilus was a high-ranking Roman official. In Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1 to verse 3. I want you to meet this man in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Theophilus, this friend of God, lover of God, beloved of God. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me, who is the me here, the one writing the gospel according to St. Luke, who is he, Luke, 
It's Luke writing. That's why you have at the head of this uh, place I'm reading the gospel according to Saint Luke. So the me in verse 3 is Luke. It seemed good to me, Luke, also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke was writing the gospel to Theophilus. And when the Acts of the Apostles was written, the same person said, Theophilus, you remember the volume one I sent to you? You remember that I told you that Jesus began to do something and to teach something. Now that's what the head of the church did. Now I'm going to write unto you what the body of the church, what the body of Christ did. I've told you what the head did, now you must know what the body did. I've told you what Christ did, I must now tell you what the apostles and disciples did. I've told you what happened in only three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I must now tell you what happened in 30 years as the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth by the apostles and the disciples. So Luke was writing to Theophilus. Now he called him most excellent Theophilus. Why did he call him most excellent Theophilus? Because high ranking officials were addressed that way. You know, even today, when you go to the court and a lawyer is referring to the magistrate, he says, my lord, the magistrate. That's a title of uh, respect, a title that you use for a high-ranking official. And uh, saying most excellent Theophilus is almost saying, uh, my lord, Theophilus, in, in normal language from a lawyer to a magistrate. And so this Theophilus was a Roman official, high in rank. Look at Acts chapter 23, verses 25 and 26. Acts 23, verses 25 and 26. And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor, most excellent governor Felix, sending greeting. He was a governor, a, a, a great high official, and so that's why it's referred to as most excellent. And the same thing goes for Theophilus as most excellent Theophilus. What do we know about Luke? Luke is mentioned three times in the New Testament. It's called the beloved physician. It's called by Paul, my fellow laborer. And I was the time was named as a companion. Only Luke is with me. Now Luke was a physician before. A medical doctor. And you know, there are many proofs that we know that he was a medical doctor. Number one, Paul the Apostle said, uh, Luke, the beloved physician, I was uh, telling the uh, church at Colossae that Luke, beloved physician, is uh, sending greetings unto you. But apart from that, as you read the original Greek of uh, the Gospel according to St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, the scholars tell us that he used not less than 400 medical words that uh, only a person familiar with medicine will be able to use. He was a real uh, physician, a great physician uh, in his own day. Before he met the Apostle Paul as a companion. But you know, after meeting the Apostle Paul, he just was so excited by the ministry of miracles, by the message of Jesus Christ, by the life of Jesus Christ, that he just gave up everything. I was following Paul all about. Preaching the gospel with Paul, becoming a fellow laborer with Paul. Well, some people would like to feel that, uh, you know, Paul was preaching the gospel, and then Luke was uh, ministering healing, giving injection, and giving pills, tablets to the people that Paul could not heal. That's a miserable type of idea. Because you see, Paul the Apostle had the gifts of the Spirit, all the nine gifts of the Spirit were resident in Paul the Apostle. And uh, we don't uh, read of any case where uh, Paul will pass a sick person on to Luke and say, well, we, prayer, pay, prayer has failed, therefore Luke, take care of him. No, sir. You know, Luke himself recorded that Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's written by Luke and Luke himself knows the power of God that heals. Luke himself said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to heal and also to bind the, those who are broken. He has told me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, Luke knew the power of God to heal. 
It was Luke that recorded, ought not this woman to be healed, uh, who had been banned by the devil? Lo, these 18 years. Luke even recorded a woman that, that suffered 12 years from the physicians, but he was, he was not healed. But when Jesus came and he taught, she taught Jesus, the person was healed. Paul, Luke knew the power of God to heal. He wasn't practicing giving injection and giving pills while following Paul. No, sir. So the writer or the author is Luke and the addressee, the, the recipient is, uh, is Theophilus. And now we look at these six things, the message, the manifestation, the might, the mystery, the mission, and the motive. We start from Acts chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 1 and 2. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Wonderful. You know what that means? Jesus was not just a miracle worker alone. He was a teacher of the word of God. Not only that, Jesus was not an empty teacher, a powerless teacher. He backed up the teaching by the miracle. And it is always like that when you are sent by God. There is miracle, there is message, there is word, there is wonder. They are joined together of what Jesus began both to do and to teach. And you see that, uh, you know, as they go hand in hand, you are just as a messenger of God, a messenger of God bringing the miracles of God. It was so with Moses. It was so with Joshua. It was so with Elijah, with Elisha. It was so with people like Daniel. It was so with the prophets of the Old Testament. It was so with Jesus, with the apostles, with the disciples as well. Miracles and message go together. The words and the wonders go together. And therefore, we must not just be preaching the word without being able to back it up with the power of the gospel. How about Moses? He worked miracles and also he gave messages. How about Joshua? The sun stopped at the prayer of Joshua. The sea, the, uh, the Jordan Sea was parted at the prayer of Joshua and then he gave messages of the word of God to the children of Israel. How about Elijah? He gave the message of God, thus says the Lord to Israel and then he also manifested the power of God. How about Elisha? The same thing. How about Daniel? He stopped the mouth of the lion and he also gave the prophetic utterances, the message of the things to come. How about Jesus? He did it and he taught it. He worked miracles and he gave messages. The words were there, the wonders were there. How about the apostles in the Acts of the Apostles? Well, silver and gold have I none. What I have I give unto thee. Rise up and walk. And after that miracle, a preaching followed. Therefore, it means there is power, there is preaching. There is wonder, there is word. There is message, there is as miracle. What he began both to do and to teach. And if you are going to be a preacher today, Make sure the power of God is in your life. It's not just preaching without power. It's not just, um, you know, speaking about the Holy Ghost without the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. They must go hand in hand. But, you know, he gave them the pertinent message. We're told that he continued to teach them until the day in which he was taken up. You know, before you receive the Holy Ghost, you must receive the teaching. Jesus Christ knew he was going to give the disciples the Holy Ghost. But, you know, if you receive the Holy Ghost and there is no message in your heart, what are you going to preach after you have got the Holy Ghost? You know, if you have power, but you don't have purity, you will do havoc, you will do harm. That's why God will not want to give his power to those who are not pure, because you'll use it for the wrong motive. You'll use it in the wrong direction. So he'll invite you and you'll know Jesus Christ. You will love Jesus Christ. You will have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know the message of Jesus Christ. You will receive the teaching and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. There will be peace in your heart. There will be the purity of God in your heart. And after that, you will have the power of God to be able to minister to other people. You are taught. You receive the message. And after that, the power of God will come. The might will come. He was teaching them until the day he was taken up. After that, he is through the Holy Ghost at giving commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Chosen. My brother, my sister, he has chosen you. Keep your hand in his hand. He has chosen you. Keep yourself in his love. He has chosen you. Remain in the kingdom of God. And he has chosen you to bear fruit. Therefore, keep coming and let the Holy Ghost come upon you. So that the purpose for which he has chosen you will be fulfilled. We have seen the pertinent message and we have seen that Jesus Christ combined the message and the miracle. Combined the power and the proclamation. Combined the word and the wonder. Combined 
teaching and uh, doing. He did it and he taught it. And that is the same pattern we are to follow as children of God. You know, he has left an example for us on how to minister, how to be a real preacher of the gospel. The power must go along with the preaching. Now let's go to the next point, the personal manifestation. You know that when Jesus Christ was betrayed into the hands of enemies, when he was tried by enemies of the gospel, by Caiaphas, by Herod, by Pilate, by all those uh, people, when he was nailed to the cross, the disciples, they ran away in fear, in panic. They trembled and they forsook him. And then the third day, he rose from the dead. But he was still behind closed doors. How would they have known? The only person that first knew about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was just a woman, a weaker vessel. And she came to the disciples. They will not believe. They were still afraid. And so there was something that was necessary. If these weak believers, if these weak apostles and disciples were to come out behind the closed doors and come into the open before Jerusalem, before the council, before everybody and declare, Jesus is risen, then Jesus must personally appear to them. That's why we have the personal manifestation. Because, you know, without Jesus manifesting himself to them personally, they will never come out of that room. They will never preach the gospel. They will never be bold. But apart from that, how could they have died for the gospel, for Christ, if they didn't know that Jesus rose from the dead, but Jesus came to appear before them? Now you think about it. When Jesus rose from the dead, if you were Jesus Christ, who would you appear to? In, a, in the pride of our heart, who will we appear to? Well, we'll appear to Caiaphas. We'll say, look at me. You have crucified me. I died but three days ago, but look at me. I am up again. Whatever you want to do, come and do it now. I mean, if we were. If we were, we will appear to Herod and Caiaphas and Pilate and the Roman soldiers. But Jesus did not. He appeared only to his own disciples and apostles. Because he knew if they will have that personal manifestation of the resurrected, risen, glorified Christ, they will be bold to come and declare, to go and declare he has risen, we have seen him. And that's why we have in verse 3, the personal manifestation of Jesus Christ, risen, glorified, resurrected. In verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive, after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. They saw him forty days. He was coming and going. And the Bible gives us a complete list of the people that saw him. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, then to the other women, to two disciples on the way to Emmaus, to the eleven disciples, then to Peter. There was a time he appeared to ten disciples or apostles when Thomas was absent. And he came back and he told him, We have seen the Lord. It's risen indeed. And Thomas said, I will not believe until I put my hand in the print of the, on the hand. And I put my hand also on the side. And then the eighth day Jesus came and said, Peace be unto you. And told Thomas, Reach hither your finger and reach thither your hand. And be not unbelieving. Be not of a doubtful mind, but be believing. And Thomas said, My God and my Lord. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. They actually saw Jesus Christ. He manifested himself to them by many infallible proofs. And it is so certain, so certain that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But the Sea of Galilee appeared unto his apostles again. And there was a time he appeared to about 500 brethren, according to the record in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. One of the greatest proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the boldness and commitment of the early church to preach the resurrected, risen, glorified Christ. I mean, how can you ever be able to boldly preach the Lord Jesus Christ if he was still dead and then you die for him? How can you die for a dead Christ? Yes, they died for him because they were sure he was risen. We have not believed, we have not followed a cunningly devised fable. He rose up, we saw him ourselves. And so we have the personal manifestation of the promised mind. In that verse 3, let me read that again. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. My brother, my sister, that's another reason they knew it was the same Christ. Because what was Jesus talking about before he died? The kingdom of God. 
from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel because of the kingdom of God. He told them in the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye for the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And after these things, and after that, all these things shall be added unto you. He spoke about the kingdom of God in teaching them how to pray. He said, when you pray, you say, Our Father which art in heaven, I Lord be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. They knew he was a preacher of the kingdom of God. And in Matthew chapter 13, he told them many, many parables concerning the kingdom of God. And in chapter 22 of Matthew, he told them another parable concerning the kingdom of God. I'm saying over and over, before his crucifixion, before his death, he spoke about the kingdom of God. And then he rose again from the dead. And what, what was he speaking about? The kingdom of God again. The kingdom of God again. So they knew because they saw him, Jesus has risen from the dead. They ate with him, they knew that Jesus has risen from the dead. He spoke to them, they knew Jesus has risen from the dead. Then they knew because he picked up from the very place he left before he, left, before he went away. I was talking about the kingdom before, now he rose up, he's still talking about the kingdom. By the way, why was he talking about the kingdom to them? When he was teaching them about the kingdom of God, they knew he was the king. They knew this is the king of that kingdom. But now, they killed the king, the Messiah. They crucified him, hanged him on the tree. And he was buried. Now they were discouraged. They thought, well, the kingdom of God will not come anymore. Because the king of that kingdom had been crucified. And now he rose from the dead. Which means the king who was crucified is now alive. So what should he think about? He should talk about his kingdom because he's now risen from the dead as a king. And that's why he was still talking to them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And, well, let me just share this with you. You see in this verse 3 that Jesus at the very beginning of Acts of the Apostles was talking about the kingdom of God. And look at Acts chapter 28, the very last verse. Acts chapter 28 verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. At the beginning of Acts of the Apostles, the kingdom of God. At the end of Acts of the Apostles, the same kingdom of God and teaching concerning Jesus Christ, no man forbidding him. And he taught it with all confidence. The early church knew the king is coming and the kingdom will be established. And so you have the personal manifestation of Jesus Christ to his own disciples. Now I go to the promised might. The promised might. We've had the pertinent message. The personal manifestation. Now the promised might. In Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait, but wait, but wait for the promise of the Father. Which says he, ye have heard of me. Being assembled together with them. He commanded them that he should not depart from Jerusalem. Now many people tell us today that that command is no more for us. Well, if you say that command is not for us because it mentioned Jerusalem, aren't you missing a principle out of the Bible? You see, the whole Bible is for the believer today. And when the Lord is, when the Lord told his own disciples that you must not depart from Jerusalem until the power comes upon you. Well, obviously it's not telling us to all go and take our passport, get a visa, and then go to Jerusalem and be searching for the upper room that was destroyed AD 70, many years ago. And be searching for that same upper room and go there and feel that the Holy Ghost will come there. Oh no, oh no. Peter was saved at the seaside. I was not saved at the seaside. I was saved in the church. But the same thing that Peter did before he got saved is exactly what I did before I got saved. Peter repented and believed. I repented. I believed. I got saved. Peter was taught about the principles of the kingdom of God by the mountainside because by the mountainside Jesus Christ was there and he was teaching them and the disciples were listening to him. I wasn't taught at the mountainside. I was taught in a church. I was sitting down, not on the mountain. I was sitting on a church pew. But the same message that Peter learned at the seaside, I learned in the church, sitting on the church pew. Peter was sanctified while Jesus Christ was praying, was praying for them, saying, sanctify them uh, for your word is truth. 
I wasn't sanctified because Jesus prayed in a closed uh, upper room somewhere. I was sanctified because of the same prayer, but in a place where I was praying. In answer, in response to the prayer of Jesus Christ. And therefore, you are not saved in Jerusalem. They were saved in Jerusalem. You are not saved in Jerusalem. They were sanctified in Jerusalem. You are not sanctified in Jerusalem. He told them to wait where they were saved. He told them to wait where they have been listening to him. He told them to wait in the congregation of believers where they will be able to be of one accord and listen to the word of God. The same principle is still holding today and is telling us, wait. For us, what does wait mean? It means expect the spirit to come. It means look up for the Spirit of God to come upon you. It means obey the Lord. And it means that we're getting into the Acts of the Apostles and we're studying it. Study with the children of God. It means surrender yourself to the study of this Word of God. It means as we come together with one accord, all expecting the Holy Ghost to come upon us in a great, abundant, baptismal measure. It means to wait for the children of God. Every Monday come to study so that the same Holy Ghost will come upon you. That's what it means for you and for me. So being assembled together with them, he commanded them. And he's commanding us today not to depart from Jerusalem, not to depart from this place, but to keep our mind on him, keep our attention on him, keep our gaze on him, keep consecrated to him, and be in prayer. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he says, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Do you know that he did not tell them exactly the day they will be baptized in the Holy Ghost? Because if he did, if he said, well, the Holy Ghost will come five days from now. The first and the second and the third and the fourth day, some of the believers can play around. Because they know it's, the Holy Ghost is coming on the fifth day. If you are told them it's coming on the tenth day, the first nine days, some of the people that are not serious and wholehearted with the Lord, they can just, you know, roam about and all go around. On the, on the tenth day, they will come. They will say, I've come for my share. But you know, he promised them. And he wanted to know how serious they were in doing, that, in doing the work. And he knew they couldn't do the work without having the Holy Ghost. So he told them, you will receive the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And to, today, the same thing applies to us. He has told us already we're studying the Acts of the Apostles. He's leading us into this book, and we're going to be empowered, energized, and close, and endured to a power from on high. But the very minute of the day it will come, for you as an individual, will depend upon your faithfulness to the Lord, meeting the condition, consecrating yourself to the Lord, getting everything settled with the Lord, and having one single mind, one single purpose, with all attention, focusing your attention upon him, and the Holy Ghost will come. Ours is to be faithful. Ours is to keep on coming. Ours is to be expecting as we come every Monday that the Lord, as he said, will pour out his spirit upon us. And I believe he will do it in Jesus' name. I'm looking for that day. I'm expecting for that day. I'm really anxious for that day when the spirit will come upon every brother, every sister, and every weakness in you will pass away in Jesus' name. And everywhere you go, the devil will tremble. Witches and wizards will run. You lay your hands on the sick, they shall recover. And the promises of the Bible concerning the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Then you'll become bold and powerful and faithful and wise. And the revelation of God and the glory of God will also be within you and upon you. Because it says in verse 5, For as sure as John baptized with water, so sure will I baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Not many days since. And now we go to the prophetic mystery. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Why were they asking that question? Well, the king was crucified, now he has risen up. The kingdom of God he spoke about before his death. He is not speaking about it after his resurrection. And he's telling them the Holy Ghost will come. And they can remember that Isaiah said, In that time of the kingdom, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. In that time of the kingdom, I'll pour my spirit upon dry ground. In that time of the kingdom, the deaf will receive uh, you know, healing for their ears. The blind eyes will be stopped. And no one shall say, I'm sick in that place. And they saw that power was coming. They saw that the Holy Ghost was coming. And in Ezekiel, it said, I'll sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And I'll give up my spirit upon you. And they thought if the spirit is coming and the king has come already, maybe the kingdom is ready now. 
And therefore they were asking, will you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? And he told them, that's a secret. Didn't you remember when I was talking to you in Matthew chapter 24? When I told you of that day and of that hour, knowest no man except my Father which is in heaven. And it is still the same, even though I'm risen from the dead, it is still not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power. That means it is still a mystery unto the, unto the disciples. But what he wanted them to do and to know is, occupy till I come, occupy till I come. He didn't want them to be speculating. Look at Luke chapter 19 verse 13. And he doesn't want us today speculating. Is it coming next Tuesday? Is it coming next uh, Friday? You know, if the Lord had uh, said that this is a particular time I'm coming, there are many Christians, uh, so-called Christians, who will be careless or will not do what the Lord wants them to do, and then they can loaf around. Then the year they know he is coming, they will say they are ready now, come Lord Jesus. I was a man I heard about in America. He had a message on the rapture that Jesus Christ is coming. And he thought that Jesus was coming on the 1st of January of a particular year. You know what he did? He sold his car, sold his house, sold everything, and bought many Bibles. He wanted great reward in heaven when Jesus comes. He, sold, he got many Bibles. I think about 25,000 Bibles he bought and distributed to people. And then he, he came out January 1st, expecting the Lord to come. Maybe he will put his hands in the air and feel that he was flying. And Jesus didn't come. And then he went back to the offices looking for work again. Jesus doesn't want us to get out in our pajamas and uh, some white apparel somewhere and then raise our hands to heaven and say, Okay, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. No, of that day and that hour, knowest no man. You don't know the day, but according to Luke chapter 19 verse 13, he called his ten servants. And delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. That's what he wants you to do. You have heard the pertinent message. You have seen the personal manifestation. You have seen the promised might. And you have seen now the prophetic mystery. Now you must have a purposeful mission. What's your mission? Verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. And you see, that's exactly how they did it. Do you know how many times uh, you will know as a zonal leader, you will know as an area leader, you will know as a, a house fellowship leader, you will know as a sectional leader, do you know how many times we set goals? And we say now, uh, by, by the time, by the end of this year, this church will be able to do this. This church will be able to do this. This church will be able to do this. Can we do it? Not without the power of the Holy Ghost. You know how many times the church will make their, their budgeting and their decision and set their goals at the beginning of the year. And they will say, this year we're going to reach out with the gospel. And we're going to reach Nigeria, reach West Africa, go to East Africa. By the end of the year, they have not done anything. Why? You need the Holy Ghost before those goals, missionary goals, can be fulfilled. Now, Jesus made a plan, and the goal for them, he said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Did they do it? Follow me into the Bible. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and, and the high priest, and, and and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. They did it. They filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. Even the enemies, the opposers, the persecutors, they te testified to it. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. How about Judea and Samaria? Chapter 9, verse 31. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Judea, Galilee and Samaria. Judea. All Judea. Throughout all Judea. And throughout all Galilee and throughout all Samaria. And were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And they were multiplied. It was done. In Acts chapter 17 verse 6. Acts chapter 17 verse 6. 
Jerusalem, they've done it. Judea, it's been accomplished. Samaria, that has been done. Now, the uttermost part of the earth. Let's see. Chapter 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. It was done. They reached out to the uttermost part of the earth because there was the power of God upon their lives. And many times, we, you know, we rush to preach. We rush onto mission field. We rush into wanting to do something for the Lord. And then we see that what you should have done in five days, it takes you five years. Because you see, a person that hasn't the power of God, what he tries to do in five years, when you have the power of God, in five single days, they have all been done. But now you see, we want to see the proper motive. We are creatures of reason, creatures of motivation. Before you do something, you like to be properly directed, properly motivated. You want to have a strong reason, a compelling reason for doing it. And what was the compelling reason for the apostles and disciples to do the work they did in Acts of the Apostles? Here it is, the proper motive, verses 9 to 11 of Acts chapter 1. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They were looking, according to the Greek, longingly into heaven, as if they are losing Christ. Has he gone? Oh yes, he has gone. But you know, he has given you a commandment. Now he has gone. He said, you go back to Jerusalem. Stay there. Wait there. You are going to receive the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. That power will come upon you. And as the power comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And this was a strong motive. The Lord is gone. And the Lord is going to return. And you know, the Lord is going to reward us when he comes. And because of the reward, because of the return, because of the certainty of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that makes us to go out and do what he told us to do. The pertinent message the personal manifestation, the promised mind, the prophetic mystery, the purposeful mission, now the proper motive. And you know the Lord is coming. And the Lord has told us there is work to do. He wants his church to be powerful. When Christ comes back, he's coming for a glorious church. He's coming for a powerful church. He's coming for a faithful church. And before you can have that power and that faithfulness, before you can have that authority and that boldness upon you, before you can have that faith and that wisdom and glory and revelation, there is one thing. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Only then can you be my dynamic witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. The only thing we have to do now is to obey. I've told you we're studying this book. So as to transform the weak believer into a powerful believer, into a strong believer, the one that is fearful into somebody that is bold, the one that is doubting into somebody that has real great challenging faith. And if you'll be faithful to the Lord and fulfill the conditions, the Lord himself will visit us in a mighty way. As individuals, he will visit us. As a church together, he will visit us. And we will become powerful and dynamic in Jesus' name. What we are to do tonight is just to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. Promise the Lord what he has told us to do, we will do. The book he has told us to study, we will study. And at the time when he sees that we're ready for that power, he'll pour that Holy Ghost upon us in a mighty way. Rise up and let us pray. Open yourself up to the Lord. This is a time of preparation for the time when that Holy Ghost will come upon us in a great measure. Told us to study and we are to study. Told us to wait and we are to wait. Told us to be faithful, we are to be faithful. Told us to be consecrated, we are to be consecrated.
In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for the study of your word. We thank you for the great privilege of studying this book, The Acts of the Apostles. Father, we know you have a great purpose for leading us to this book. And Father, we are also telling you that we have a great expectation as we have started the study of this book. Father, we are just asking you that your purpose for making us to study this book will not be defeated in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we know that as you have brought us into this book, you want us to fulfill some conditions so that you can pour forth your mighty power, you can pour forth your mighty spirit, you can pour forth your fullness upon our lives. Our God and our Father, we are promising you that we will fulfill every condition that we lay bare before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we know that one thing you are expecting from us at such a time like this is steadfastness, earnestness, enthusiasm, eagerness in coming to study your word. Father, we are just asking you that all through this time, as we study this book of the Acts of the Apostles here every Monday, we are asking that every one of us who are here tonight will be faithful in coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we don't just want to come alone. As we come here every Monday, let us receive mighty blessings from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our expectation, O oh God, is that the acts of the apostles will be mightily revealed in us, mightily revealed in this ministry, mightily revealed in this nation, and also the uttermost part of the earth. So, Father, we are looking up to you right now, O oh God, that right now you will lay your hands afresh upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever is going to hinder us, whatever is going to obstruct us, whatever is going to prevent us from getting your best, we are asking, O oh God, that you will take it away from our lives in Jesus' name. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we bow before you. Our ask is that we get the very best that God can supply. So we are asking you, O oh God, that as the opportunity has come, we are asked that nothing will hinder us in Jesus' name. Amen. We just ask you that more than ever before, you will pour upon us the spirit of earnestness in seeking after you, in looking after you, and actually getting your best in Jesus' name. Whatever trick that the devil may want to play on any one of us, we just ask that at such a time, at this time, we all of us will resist the devil in Jesus' name. Amen. Fathers, we've come tonight. The blessings of this day, let it come upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Right from this time, oh God, let us start seeing the oppressions of the Holy Ghost in our lives, in our homes, in our ministries, in our offices, everywhere. Let there be the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go home tonight, let the power of the Holy Ghost go with us. And let your grace rest upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you are going to bless us mightily. In Jesus' name we pray.